You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens, and I am joined with Jared Mount, my co-host. Uh, this is part two of their interview with Neil. Um, and I think we left off with, uh, we're segueing from the Shenandoah River to uh, Lake Frederick, which is out of Front Royal, Virginia. So, yeah, let's get this ball rolling. Yeah, so Neil, you, uh, we talked about, you know, different factors that determine whether if you have a choice, if you're going to fish the lake or the river. Yep. You talked about water temperature, you know, when the, obviously when the river turns on this time of year, you're going to spend most of your time on, on the river. But what are... Uh, what are the conditions or when do you determine, you know, I'm going to go hit Lake Frederick today. And then um, one thing. So Lake Frederick, how big is Lake Frederick? So people don't 117 know, like, acres, I believe. 117 acres. It's, Give or take. It's now has a, a huge development around it. Um, definitely more if you're thinking of a lake wise, a little bit more pressure than probably the mm -hmm. river. There is bank access. Yep. Um, trolling motor so only. Trolling motor. Yeah, that's a big one. Trolling motor only. You can launch a big boat, but I believe the big motor has to be up out of the water, if that's correct. So mm -hmm. yeah, there's there's multiple ways you can fish the lake just to kind of like tee this off for you. Yeah. Um, start out with uh, Lake Frederick. One fish Frederick One is, fish Frederick, is, yeah. is the <laughs> is the nickname for that place. And again, um, because it is notoriously tough and whether that be pressure or um lack of habitat or bait um i going back to the previous segment you know there's not shad in lake frederick mm -hmm. um they go with the they have elwive and bluegill would be i would say the primary forage that is um How not crayfish did get in there that is a weird one. Yeah. <laughs> I would not have um, guessed that. Yeah, no. And and there's a lot of them in there. That is crazy. Um, but that, that's the, the main source of food. So when when you're starting to uncover, well, how do I unlock a lake that I already know um, it's going to be a tough day? Mm -hmm. um, is it even worth my time to go out and beat the banks? Um, I've, you know, again, thankfully, it is one of the few lakes – in the state of Virginia that does have the Florida strain bass in there. Um, yeah, I was going to say, it, as far as big double-digit bass, they're in there. Yeah. And it's not like, again, it's going to be a common place, but they're there. So Yeah, I mean, um, that's... yeah. The, the motivation is always there uh, that you could catch your personal best. It's mm -hmm. very realistic that there is, you know, a 10-pound quality bass swimming around in there. Um, you may have to knock them on the head to get them mm -hmm. to eat, mm -hmm. but that's – Mm -hmm. That's honestly uh, a chance for you and, and to get a personal best. And it's hard to go anywhere uh, and, and find that quality of fish in Virginia. I mean, even yeah. look at Smith or, you know, Lake Anna, things like that. I mean, you catch a seven, eight pounder, mm -hmm. you know, that's that's going to that's going to win big fish of whatever tournament you're at. Yeah. Um, but you can go out at Frederick and catch a seven and there could have been a 10 with it. Um, mm -hmm. So that's one nice thing. But when am I going to focus on that? Well, first off, I like the warming temperatures. Whenever I noticed a trend where the day before and the week before, I got warmer conditions. So we're looking at whenever that time in March happens where, okay, it's starting to warm up, but mainly I'm just looking at weather patterns. All right, is, are we on a warming trend? I don't care if it's 50. I just want it to be... It was 48 yesterday and now it's 50. I feel like that's when those fish really start to move. And, you know, for a lake like that, a lot of uh, people like to go out, especially and do some bed fishing and things like that. It's a great lake to go out and practice um, fishing on beds and sight fishing and things like that. So, I, yeah, so I caught a massive one at their second national championship in Lake Kiwi. And it was a bed fish. And I have to credit growing up fishing Lake Frederick and knowing mm -hmm. this is one of the places that you can go close and actually practice bed fishing mm -hmm. and seeing monsters around there and knowing you can't catch them. Mm -hmm. But yeah, yeah. Not being able to see. No, to see um, <laughs> no, it, it's it's a great place uh, to go, honestly. I mean, yeah, you're trolling motor only, which again, um, it, it can be difficult because if you feel like you're in an area where there's not fish, you don't have that ability 
to just run to the other yeah. side of the lake. I, I look at Lake Frederick, you just have to go into it with the mindset of I'm going to put my head down and I am going to have to beat the banks and move around. And if I do find an area, you may have to sit and drop on a fish, whether you marked a brush pile or, you know, you felt the bite. I completely different than the river. I'm, I'm sitting on a spot, um, maybe all day. I, and I've done that before. I've spent eight hours in one spot and I only pulled like, you know, maybe six or seven fish off of a brush pile, but I just felt like I really probably wouldn't have any of better luck had I beat the bank anywhere else. Topography wise, um, for, for the people that don't know, um, Lake Frederick is definitely not like the Shenandoah in, in two ways, I think. One is flow rate. You know, there's no major creek that they dammed up to create it, so you don't have usually a great current flow rate. And number two, the depth. Um, if you are if you think Shenandoah River, two to eight feet, generally speaking, and then, of course, Riverton is a little bit deeper, but then Lake mm -hmm. Frederick, it's you could step off the bank and be over your head. It's yeah. insanely deep in places. Yeah, uh, which, again, that, that creates that situation where – you're dealing with suspended bass mm -hmm. and that's the toughest, you know, we're now starting to break into technology that I don't even have where you are able to see with live scope yeah. and the Garmin stuff out there that you can mark suspended fish and actively see them out there. Um, I don't have that capability. So I just kind of go with where I think they might be suspended um, or telltale signs and look for bait, but things like that. But generally the springtime patterns work there um, when they start to, to move back into the channel swings and they will push up close to the bank. That's going to be your best chance to catch them because you have a window there where they are going to be shallow and then they're not going to be there for another year. Some of them. Um, and, and that's something, um, and I'm probably going to mess up your whole, your no. whole line of thought here, but because of the L wife. And so <clears throat> for people that don't know, um, that have followed me on my channel, I talk about blueback herring a lot because I had to cut my teeth in college tournaments and it's something called a pelagic species of bait fish, which means it's just kind of like a tuna where it just roams in the middle of nowhere. And, and, and a shad is kind of like that, but shad even come closer to shore than like an L wife or a blueback herring. Now having this bait present in Lake Frederick just changed the biological behavior of the bass. And mm -hmm. that's something I want to segue into to here. Do you feel like knowing if the L wife are in here, because I just figured that out five seconds ago, mm -hmm. um, does that change the way they act when it's not betting time and it forces them shallow? Do you feel like they are typically like how in Lake Anna fish or Smith mountain lake or a pond bass? Do you think they act a little bit different with the L wife in there? Yeah. Uh, and, and I think, that complements the topography of the lake as well being it is so deep mm -hmm. there's there's small areas where they can go get shallow and bed okay, um yeah. so mm -hmm. i think it's a combination of these fish are kind of in no man's land a while because there's there's not grass that you're fishing mm -hmm. they're not going to be up shallow you may find a lay down that's going to hold like a two or three pounder but you i can't pattern the whole lake on laydowns That's you right. you can't do it um it just becomes too difficult um i i've gone to brush piles or any man-made structure lake frederick does do a great job with it being state regulated to put man-made structures out yeah i was going to say too i was just looking uh, if you look up the website and um the state site they have uh, they say it's 50 foot is the deepest and average of 20 but you go on down, they have a Lake Frederick fish habitat uh, map where they have, I know, I know of three different times they've gone out and sunk structure um, in that lake. So, And we're going to um, put in the uh, the episode description a link to Lake Frederick. And then the earlier episode, we're going to put a link to the Shenandoah River, places like that. So you, you can actually follow along with us, but you actually know where to go and things of, of that too. Um, but yeah, like then that's something like I definitely how that changes it and and you can think here in virginia you can have such differences where you can go from fishing a river whether it's the summer or the winter time and you're fishing eight to ten feet current based to possibly fishing a pelagic species of bass but then also be betting for 10 pounders like it's very interesting we're doing that in less than what 50 mile radius you can go from one to the other yeah and you're right i think the same thing's happened up at lake holiday as well and that that <laughs> when when those fish and you mentioned suspended or when they're chasing the bait and that bait is out in maybe that 50 foot of water and they're suspended at at 20 foot let's say or mm -hmm. 20 or 30 foot that 
most anglers, we can relate to that bottom mm -hmm. or that log that we can see in the water. We can fish those areas, but when you put us out into the middle of the lake and, and to be able to try to catch that fish that's suspended, uh, that's probably one of the toughest. And that therein correlates to why we always say it's such, like there's no fish, but they're, they're there. It's just we haven't been able to adapt to be able to catch those fish. Yeah. And like you were alluding to on the river, they're moving too. They're swimming. They're not just staying on, they're not staying wherever that bait goes. They're going with it. And so it makes it very difficult as an angler to be able to, like you said, you can't pattern. Yeah. My, my success that I found on Frederick, it, it started when I started looking up spotted bass techniques. Mm -hmm. Now we don't have any spotted bass lakes mm -hmm. around here, but I've found their patterns and how they feed mm -hmm. and how they school up is very similar to a spotted bass just because they don't have the big flats to get on mm. it's like mm. pre-spawn they they go from maybe like that 16 to 18 range up to 12 and then it's like they're in two feet for you know four days to bed and then they're back out in 12 and then they disappear mm. again and i have to add why that just it, my eyes lit up because most of the best smallmouth or sorry most of the best spotted bass reservoirs in the united states have blueback herring in them lake hartwell is a great example lake lanier tons of pelagic bait and that forces the spot to become that roamer mm -hmm. and that just is insane that those are the connections there where you started you stopped looking at the largemouth like a largemouth was this big fat mm -hmm. thing that sits underneath the tree and now he's adapted to this roamer and you making that connection boom you have success yeah um so again i i go back to my small swim baits and, and it's ironically enough um i don't have to change my setups mm. that i use on the river really okay that's yeah. that yeah. question but that's yeah yeah it, it makes it makes it convenient because um you know light line again comes into play and the, mm. yeah it's it's a big deep clear lake mm. and suspended fish so drop shot and small swim baits um, not only going to get you bites, but my biggest largemouth I've ever caught, uh, came out of Lake Frederick on a small one knot mosquito hooked drop shot bait. The big, puckered you up real I mean, <laughs> I mean, it was, it's incredible. And you, you know, in your mind, um, it's just so hard because you relate to the Florida fish or the Texas mm -hmm. fish, these huge monster mm -hmm. bass. And you got huge gear on with 20 pound line and a big five aught hook with, you know, maybe a 10 inch worm or, you know, you were flipping something with a big jig and, you know, I'm not, it's just different fishing that mm -hmm. to me, that sounds fun. Cause I don't do a lot of it, yeah. but like punching mats and like seeing targets and, mm -hmm. you know, getting into shallow flipping. Um, I, I just, you have to get in the mindset of like where everyone else goes around the bank. i keep my boat way way far off the bank where i'm casting where people have their boats in mm -hmm. that are fishing the bank and i have just stopped worried about it i'm i'm hunting for a completely different fish he don't live on the bank and i don't want to catch him there mm -hmm. um and that's important for our viewers at home to understand um and i just know this because i spent two months living down there getting prepped for tournaments on pelagic places lake murray lake hartwell and lake kiwi this is like a wolf and it's insane that you can have largemouth that are like the Florida strain that are in Florida or a, a, a Smith Mountain Lake that they are fat and lazy and you can dock pattern. You get these pelagic ones that, that follow the bait and you'll have six pounders that have the stamina of a smallmouth because they hunt. Mm -hmm. And I remember the, the funniest time when, when we got down to Lake Murray and they told us this and he said, like, look for these little bumps in the bottom where it's like 100 feet and it bounces up to 50 and that that forces the bait because this pelagic stuff will it'll force them into a pinch point point. and so we got out there and we were throwing these big bastard swim baits the first time i ever had success with them and you chuck them out there and all of a sudden that that bait pushes up on there and you just get fat in a hurry and you're smoking 20 pound bags and all of a sudden it's gone because the bait left but it's mm -hmm. just like that pinch point like you would if you're a striped bass fishing mm -hmm. on the chesapeake hmm. and all it is they're just following the bait that mm -hmm. that that's their ambush point and it's unless you're used to that, it's insane because it blows your mind, like you said, because yeah. you're not used to that. You could go down the docks at Lake Murray and like, I'm not catching shit. Mm -hmm. And then people are out there in the middle of nowhere and you think they're striper fishing. Mm -hmm. No, they're not. They're, they're, they're catching those largemouth yeah. out that are following the bait. It, it is crazy. Yeah. Um, and that's where 
I've learned, and, and it, it doesn't take long um, to go around the banks there and, and you're not getting those bites. And I mean, you can just look at the bank and see all the lures that have been hung up and broke off. <laughs> I mean, they're getting pressure, but it, I almost feel like it's fine for me because I know I'm fishing how not a lot of other people are fishing mm -hmm. it out there. Right. Um, but it, but it is, it's, it's mentally challenging because it's like, it can happen so quick. Like you talked mm -hmm. about where they turn on mm -hmm. and, and you can catch them quick in a hurry. And then it's like, where'd they go? A light switch. It's done. And you may go back in an hour. They're still not there. Come back two hours. They're still not there. Mm -hmm. Um, there, there'll be these small windows and it, you might not even be able to replicate that day to day because they are moving but it's just more or less it's like all right well i'm still gonna stay deep and you know keep grinding it out there because you just know that they're they're really not on the bank um again not saying that you couldn't go and catch one or two but but these fish that are schooled up the ones that i'm looking to catch are not on the bank you know, it's amazing too. I always heard, and this is true. If you're bank fishing, when you were bank fishing, you're throwing out as far as you can. Yeah. But when you, as soon as you get on that boat, you're going to position that boat and throw to the bank, right? So, and you're right. More times than not, those fish are going to be where that boat is out. You know, and that's the biggest advice I had heard with Lake Frederick is get off the bank, get off the bank, especially mm -hmm. those deeper points. You know, and it's hard again. It's hard in our minds, but when yeah. you can learn to get off the bank and fish off the bank success will start to come yeah and and again um for the bank fishermen out there that do go to a place like mm -hmm. frederick you're not doing anything wrong mm -hmm. by being on the bank and casting mm -hmm. out and not getting bites mm -hmm. because there's been times where I, i'll i'll make the same exact cast upwards of 30 to 50 times consecutively at a same area and it, for whatever reason that like 34th time is when she decided to bite mm -hmm. and Again, I, I don't know if that is a pressure thing or just finally I was able to put it, but you know, you can make the same cast. So for the mm -hmm. people out on the bank, um, yeah, keep you're, growing. yeah, yeah. You, you keep, keep grinding it. And mm -hmm. again, um, some of my biggest success and a, a great time that I like to get out to Frederick, um, it's, it's a great place to get out there after dark. Yeah. Um, yeah. you know, don't, don't be that. afraid um mm -hmm. to go out after dark you know you might be there with a couple guys catfishing but i used to walk that dam at night i would just got a, a black lure i'd use a uh i think i was using a zoom z crawl in the black light color it's like this super you know deep mm -hmm. purple with blue flake um fluorescent looking and i would just throw that on like a quarter ounce bullet weight and just mm -hmm. jig it around the dam and I have success with that. And and that is the one time where they will move shallow, I feel like, due to water right. clarity and sunlight. Mm -hmm. That sun's not penetrating down. So there's a whole nother class of fish mm -hmm. that pulls up after dark. Um That's and, great advice. Yeah. yeah that's true. And and great being advice. a being a trolling motor only lake, um, you know, safety thing, as long as you've got your lights on, you don't have yeah. to worry about somebody buzzing by you late at night um things like that so that's I, i'll my mindset completely changes mm. so anytime you know spring sets in and the water temps are above 60 and i got time there are some days where i won't even look to even go out until 6 p.m and i'll fish that evening bite and then into the night and then so you're saying after the spawn occurs you would switch tonight or or, or yeah at the same time okay yeah no so uh, so after the spawn has happened so once i've determined that you know i'm not seeing anything on beds anymore and the bluegill you, you can pattern frederick easy Good because because yes. the bluegill will move up there and and you'll see it uh it, you'll start seeing a, a whole it looks like a, a moon they get up yes. in in the, the shallow sandy areas and there'll just be a huge little spots where all the bluegill are up there and that's generally bass are done when the bluegill have <sighs> moved up and then that's when i love to go out at night because they're chasing those big bluegill i don't that i'm assuming they feel safer because that light isn't penetrating and there will be a shallow bite on these places where you can't go and 
same thing happens to me at a lake holiday no, absolutely. um where there are guys that only go out at night, night yeah. yeah and it's hard i think you know again the norm used to be well you're going to catfish at night you know it's kind of like what you're doing a catfish at night but I, for those that haven't done it and don't change anything that you're doing i mean anything yeah. from slow rolling a you know colorado blade spinner bait you know on the bottom let it hit the yeah. bottom like you said just get it thumping slow roll it but even a jig throw it throw anything you're going to throw a big worm doesn't matter drag that jig and it's it's i think i personally think too you're more in tune with the bait because you're not distracted by everything else that's going on that you can see it's dark out so you're you're really in tune with the yeah. bait on the other end of the line yeah. but the fish they're you're right they're as aggressive if not more aggressive and they'll pick it up just like you know so don't you don't have to change anything yeah uh fish just like you would fish but you're you'll have more success at night that uh, time. yeah and then i think once we get closer to that time please don't try to night fish in november or december you'll die but i think once we get closer to the springtime i think we should do a 100 percent a night mm -hmm. episode like because yeah, I, I almost idea. killed a person on a dock because i was night fishing i didn't see the dock i hit him upside the head with a jig so <laughs> there is a way you have to like you got to get your boat set up right. you want to make sure you have read like I, I would definitely think we should do mm -hmm. a night episode like yeah. how do you approach that so you're safe mm -hmm. and can still have fun with it mm -hmm. um and but there's another lake that's in the area that we haven't touched on the legendary infamous uh lake holiday um yeah. i've never been there before so you want to give the the people at home like what is lake holiday what does it look yeah. like yeah and it's um you know lake holiday it's 250 acres and in the day back in the day i think the late mid to late 70s i think is when they they dammed it up uh isaac creek feeds it um great fishery uh fish is like a big lake it's a lot deeper i think 85 to 90 feet in the deepest end down by the dam uh big lake features um was fishing phenomenal um up until they had to do some changes to the dam um and so they drew the lake down about 10 foot and at that time i think you know several things happened obviously kind of like a bathtub bathtub concept you know, a lot of the mm -hmm. the you know crayfish and everything pulled back uh kind of I don't want to say it killed the grass, but the grass went dormant. Um, and then they filled the lake back up. And then right after that, there was, we had a lot of, hyd I shouldn't even say a lot of hydrilla. There was, the hydrilla had become thick. And I know there were some, you know, people, the dock owners and different you know, uh. kayakers and things were, you know, not happy with that. And fishermen loved it because yep. and the thing with Lake Holiday that you need to know too is, uh, only 30% of the lake of that 250 acres can actually even have grass because of the depth of the lake. So, you know, that 10 to 12 foot where the light's going to penetrate and that grass can grow. Um, so they put, there was a mistake was made. doesn't matter who made the mistake. Uh, they put entirely too many grass carp in. It was mm. supposed to be two to three per vegetative acre. Uh, but actually they did two to three per total acreage. So that mistake was made. I think the same thing happened like Frederick too, where they, mm -hmm. They completely, so any vegetation that was in there is now gone. It's, it's desert-like conditions. And that's been probably going on four or five years ago now. Um, the grass carp are now, I think, at a low enough population that the grass, they are starting to see grass coming back this, this past summer. So we feel like hopefully we're going to get on the, the right side of this thing again because um, what essentially happened, it went from becoming probably one of the top fisheries, I don't want to say in the state, but it was, I mean, it had really good small mouth, large mouth population. Um, it, it just changed how it fished and very similar to Lake Frederick in mm -hmm. that what you used to be able to catch on the, along the banks, those fish yeah. are now out chasing <laughs> their wives out in the deep. And so, uh, I believe the fish are there. It's just, you know, we haven't been able to catch them. But with that said, We've done a couple different stockings where we've stocked uh, smallmouth both times. Uh, we've stocked uh, walleye, and then we did some crappy this last time. And so we're hoping with the return of the vegetation, this lake will go back to being the fishery it once was. And I only want to throw that out there because uh, anybody that has fished it back in the day knows how great it was. Um, if you were to go out there now, uh, a lot of people are struggling to catch fish and it's, it's, uh, not a good situation, but Neil, Neil's had some success out there. And, and so if you want to talk about that, Neil. Yeah. Um, again, very similar to Lake Frederick. Um, and you can just go ahead and eliminate based on conditions. There's going to be no ripping through a rattle trap through a grass or, you know, running a spinner bait or chatterbait through weeds and things like that. 
it's just non-existent um same thing you step off the bank you're in 20 feet in mm. most places on the lake um so it can be a little tough now the pressure because it is a private lake um in order to fish the lake first off uh you would have to be a resident of the lake mm. um or you know own some sort of property in there that would give you access like a membership lot or things like that and it's not even to the situation of if i know somebody i can get access the boat does have to be registered mm -hmm. to the resident of the lake so point. that does handicap that fishing um but again uh a little bit less pressure than mm -hmm. frederick um you're not going to get the quality of largemouth in there that frederick does hold but i think it has a lot to offer with not only the walleye but the yellow perch mm -hmm. um so in those colder conditions if i don't go to the river i would prefer lake holiday over lake frederick just because walleye yellow perch it has a little bit more diversity um and those mm -hmm. fish can be fun to catch um even when it's cold there's been plenty of mistake huge yellow perch mm -hmm. i've caught bass fishing I might have missed this, but what is the the size comparison of Lake Holiday and Frederick? How big so is So Frederick was 117 acres mm -hmm. uh, versus two, I think 250, I think is what they. Yeah. Okay. So Lake Holiday is bigger. Yeah, yeah bigger. it's bigger. And uh, you can run uh, outboard, your outboard yeah. motor, inboard motor. It's, mm -hmm. you know, there's no regulations put on trolling motors or anything mm -hmm. like that. Um, the, there's a 36 mile an hour speed yeah, limit. Yeah, there's a speed limit. And then the lake is kind of segmented in half so that um the deeper part by the dam is that's going to be for your pleasure boaters that can do things like water sports or you know pontoons mm -hmm. and then the other half of the lake is a no wake zone so it's very fisherman friendly um at least even during the summer you can always get into like the area that would be no wake mm -hmm. um you know and, and find success there um but yeah same same type of setups that i'm using at frederick you know small swim baits and things like that um and you said the forage is the same as like frederick as like holiday like what what is the forage uh at lake holiday just for the viewers at the home? AOY yeah, well, is it aof too yeah a yeah. great fish um yep and then bluegill, bluegill okay. yellow small yellow, yellow perch, perch and and things like that um and it does have both largemouth and smallmouth mm -hmm. versus Frederick, you're only dealing with largemouth. Mm -hmm. I know there has been a very few um, smallmouth caught out of Lake Frederick, but it would be nothing to have a day where you caught a mixed bag mm -hmm. of both smallmouth and largemouth. And those smallmouth were pushing five. I've seen five, six, and there was one that was, uh, it, I never saw the actual reading on the scale, but it looked to be close to seven pounds. I always felt like the, the state record, which is a little over eight pounds, uh, the new river I, I always felt like it could come out of lake holiday because of the depth um and uh but you know i haven't seen anything recently so uh we'll have to see yeah and again the it. the mindset of river smallmouth fishing mm -hmm. versus lake smallmouth yep, fishing that opens up a whole new mm -hmm. world uh something that i learned at smith mountain lake of how the largemouth bite not may not be there but I, if i run you know you know, down towards the Blackwater area of mm -hmm. Smith Mountain Lake, I could get into some smallmouth in some mm -hmm. of those deeper areas. So again, the smallmouth are slightly easier to catch in the deep water mm -hmm. um, than the largemouth. I don't know um, why that is, if it's more aggressive or if they just hold a little bit closer mm -hmm. to the bottom versus suspending. Um, but again, it's a very good fishery. It's diverse. Um, there's really not a whole, I can't think of a place in the state where you can go catch Yellow perch, smallmouth, largemouth, walleye, mm -hmm. um, channel cats, mm -hmm. all in one lake, you know, along with bluegill and crappie. They've, they've got it all, um, mm -hmm. pretty much everything that the state has to offer that doesn't have teeth um, you mm -hmm. can catch mm -hmm. um, up there. Now, do you have to use a separate boat to have access to Lake Holiday? Do you get to use your own boat? Like, how does that all work? I, yeah. If somebody wanted to somehow figure out a way to fish Lake Holiday, how would they go about no, that? No, like he was saying, they um, you have to have your boat registered. So you okay. either have to own a house up there, or they do have membership lots. So a lot of guys do, um, and I don't know if there's still any available, but they, be, they come available. Uh, so a membership lot would be, and you can get those pretty inexpensive, like under $5,000 for the lot. Mm -hmm. 
and then you would have uh, it's right around eight hundred dollars to a thousand dollars a year as far as regist boat registration, taxes, insurance, all that stuff um, to be have a membership lot uh, that you wouldn't build on, but that gets you through the gate. You would be uh -huh. able to get your boat registered. You'd be able to bring your boat in. But besides that, even your kayaks and everything, it's, it's, it's pretty tight. There's a gate there and it is, it is a private community. So whether you, you have to have that again, a house a residence or a membership lot to get in, which is kind of nice though, because it is, it's, it's private, you know? Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. and, and I think that does make it tough for, you know, somebody, if you're not, uh, not one of those two things, but, if you know somebody up there, you can, you know, befriend them or whatever, and, and maybe they mm -hmm. can get you in and you can, you know, fish with them. And something else I just, that, that really <clears throat> dawned on my head is we've talked about in these two interviews, um, the Shenandoah River, Lake Frederick and Lake Holiday, and Shad never came up once. And I think this is important because if you are a kid or you're someone new to fishing and you pick up a Bassmasters or in Fisherman, they talk about that literally you could do a drinking game to how much they talk about follow the shad and we listed three fisheries one that you could easily catch the fish of a lifetime and we never talked about shad mm -hmm. you know and that does mm -hmm. change the pattern of behavior of the fish but also how you how you really get information because if you did i think you talked about i don't know if it's on camera or not like i bought a bunch of white stuff because they said to you know do yeah. the shad thing mm -hmm. well that's not necessarily correct and you need to really figure out what is the primary forage at the place you're going and then from there get the dissemination of the correct information mm -hmm. um so with lake holiday one thing was perch and i know when i used to fish college and we go up to like lake chicago lake chautauqua cayuga and there's a bazillion perch and that's actually a pattern in of itself um when you fish there it, how do you pattern like the colors of your baits are you using those white patterns or what, what, what do you do yeah so thankfully um you know, and, and I'm great that we're doing this because the information is, is not out there um, for how to fish a lot of these lakes. For highland reservoirs that do not have shad, don't have grass, it's like, wow, like that's everything that you'd want to read about. Yep. All the great fisheries <laughs> have tons of grass. You go to Gunnersville, it's, you know, you run the hydrilla patterns and things like that. They've got a lot of docks and things. Um, this is going to be the first fishery that does have docks. So it is kind of nice. Um, you can at least get a little bit of everything minus the grass at holiday because they do have deep docks, shaded docks, docks on point. So there could be a dock pattern that I go on to there. As far as the colors go, um, white can work just because you know, even though it's not shad, I, I almost feel like it's, it's just getting it in front of the fish when you're dealing with the suspended fish. Um, the, it's like you're fishing for like micro guppy looking L wives because they are very tiny. So a lot of times, you know, just fishing like a very, very small, you know, swim bait on a quarter ounce jig head is the way to go. If you're going to target those fish, um, I do have some hard baits that, that are with the yellow patterns. I will bust out deep divers here um, that are the shad pattern. I think it's more or less if they're going for a reaction, the color doesn't really matter. So the shad pattern colors will still work anywhere. Um, it's just that are the fish going to be there? And and. I'm sorry to cut you off, but this is like major because I know when I was a kid and I went to Lake Frederick because before I got, I was lucky enough to get a bass boat. I, I had an old tracker that my dad, the dad got us and I, I threw these big bass tricks. Like what's the size of swim bait you're using? Is it 10 inches? Is it six inches like Bassmaster no, says? About two Not inches. Two, about, about two yeah, inches. Two and three quarter inches, 2.75 inches at that yeah. med size. And I will tell you, and I, I can show you later, we'll maybe do another segment. It took me forever. Now we were catching them up there at Lake. That's where Lake Holidays we first really came onto this. And I was hearing some information uh, down at Richmond and just different things. And and this this Ned rig too. I honestly, it's been around forever. And I remember Roger Fuller who does ties our jigs and, and hair jigs. Um, they caught a little dinger, and we were selling them early on too. And they were a yum yum dinger. Um, and they swore by them, you know, on the river. Well, then Z Man kind of repatent this thing and got it back out there and that's what we know about now but for me i couldn't figure out we were you'd catch small fish you'd catch little big fish it didn't matter you caught fish on these and a lot of guys won't throw them but i could not figure out it's so so just stupid it's just mm -hmm. 2.75 inches stick worm like what is it that why are they eating this and it wasn't until 
I threw one in the minnow tank one time. I dropped it down the minnow tank in that medium-sized minnow. It is identical. You couldn't tell the Ned from the minnow, whether you were fishing it nose down on the bottom like it's feeding or you're jigging it and keeping it in the in the, the bait. I mean, it mm-hmm. looked identical. So to me, it triggered and it said, you know what? If that's what they're eating, that's what they're eating. And again, I don't care what size the fish is. That's food to them. And that, yeah, that small profile yeah. is is what it, they're, they're it, triggering. It is. On. So I would agree with you. I mean, I yeah. like the green pumpkin co- uh, goby. I like the, the yoga pants are the black, you know, straight mm-hmm. black. But, um, you know, I don't know that, that I would agree with you. I and mean, a lot of people go crazy when you tell them color doesn't matter. You know, it's not that it, and I think in our minds, I think we correlate. Mm-hmm. That's my confident bait because that's what, you know, but I would challenge. I think, I think size point trumps color in a lot of situations and it's and not and again understanding <clears throat> matching the hatch and understanding that the bait needs to to really mirror where you're fishing and it's not to to completely just bash bass masters but it's, mm-hmm. it's understanding like in our area you know you have to mimic it a little differently and if you go out there with, with a a swim bait that is correct size and i bet if you come to jake's bait and tackle or wherever you get your tackle depending on where you're listening find out what the bait is and if there's not a lot of shad in there it's probably going to be something smaller, whether it's a a, a Caltech, um, you know, two point five inch swim bait or a Ned rig. Get something smaller, and that does not mean you're going to catch dinks. It mm-hmm. just means you're fishing the right size bait to where you are. Right. And I have mm-hmm. so many kids that will will come to me and be like, in my other job, and like they said, like we Google wire to fish, and they say like, well, they're on a gizzard shed bite here. You're like, yeah, at Kentucky Lake. If you throw a bull shad in a pond, you're not going to have success. Go get a couple of these little baits and mm-hmm. you will have fun because you're matching what what's mm-hmm. going to be around there. And the last story I have, like when you're saying about matching it with the Ned Rick, I was I had a guided trip two years ago. We were kayak fishing on the Shenandoah and I had one rod. I had the Ned Rick rod laying right here off the side and I was tying something. Boom, one caught it. I didn't know why and unhook it fine. Put that rod back there. I was floating on finishes. Boom, caught another one. What I realized was that Ned rig sitting off the side of the boat just drifting, mm-hmm. and they were nailing it because they wanted that smaller mm-hmm. size profile. And and mm-hmm. again, it doesn't mean you're giving up and you're not going to have some chances of success, but you got to make sure you match what the fish want all the time. Um, but then yeah. back to color after that little. T- <laughs> after that yeah, little no, and, and that's that's the thing. Uh, Google how to catch big bass, or like you want to see one caught. It's someone at clear lake california yes. throwing a big swim bait mm-hmm. and that mm-hmm. it's because there's gizzard shad or kokanee trout that yeah, they're trying trout. to emulate and things like that not saying that that couldn't work here That's because right. i have thrown big swim baits and glide baits mm-hmm. and been able to catch them but that was a specific time pre-spawn where I am, you know, actively trying to get a big fish to bite. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know they're in the area because they're on beds and things like that. But the other percentage of the year, the other 10 months, mm-hmm. um, the bait that you're eating, I mean, it'd be hard to catch these owl wives in, in a cast net. I mean, they're tiny. I mean, you're not there. And, and when you see them, when you catch them, I've had them just check your live wells or if you catch, just check to see what the fish is doing. You know, do they have a hard belly or is it crayfish? And no, it's a, it's a bunch of these tiny little guppy looking mm-hmm. bait and that's what they're eating. So to even go to like a four or five inch swim bait, not saying that you could not get that bite, but the bait mm-hmm. is just not that big. Yeah. Um, and a, a technique that I have focused on recently that has worked for me is the Demiki rig mm-hmm. um, and fishing for those suspended fish um, and long lining and, and figuring out different techniques. You really have to get into um, a, a place that, that I've tried to look up to get advice from it is a, like a Dale Hollow or like some of the Tennessee mm-hmm. Highland reservoirs and those techniques. Um, everything from a float and fly mm-hmm. to, you know, how to fish these small baits down bluffs and things like that. But yeah, you're, you're fishing for that suspended fish and you're not grinding through rocks. You're not running. I mean, I, I, I barely have any square bills, which is like, mm-hmm. you look up every Bassmaster anglers, like favorite lure everyone's got a square bill on there i, I i've got them because you, you gotta buy everything but <laughs> i don't use square bills I, it's just they not that they don't work because a percentage of the time you know you can catch them on anything 
But uh, for the most part, I don't have any crankbaits that are running that two to three depth. Um, they just don't work. Or if they do, I find out, well, shoot, I, I had a backlash. I cast it out in the middle of the lake and I ran this square bill over 20 feet and caught a bass. Mm -hmm. So then it's just like, it just clicks for you. So it, you just got to eliminate mm -hmm. and figure out what your areas works. And, and if the information is not out there for you to find, um, those are the areas to try to look to emulate. Mm -hmm. You bring up another, you said, you know, the hair, the float and fly, and that is something in our area that is predominant. I mean, tube tubes and then, but also the hair jig and I'm talking deer hair jig mm -hmm. fished in its smaller profile. You put a little trailer on it, dynamite on the river and we'll also work up there. And then the marabou float and fly, uh, Gene Cunningham is another old timer that I'll never forget. This been this has probably been seven eight years ago, and we were up the holiday. It was cold, cold, and he had a longer longer pole, and he was doing the float and fly technique uh, with a marabou jig. And that marabou, that hair, just kind of once it gets wet, it just kind of dances in the water. And he he probably had six or seven. You know, we were getting skunked at the point. So Dad had one. He tied it on, and, and you know we caught some fish after that. So it was definitely a lesson learned for me yeah. too that. You know, and it's hard for a lot of anglers. When you're a power fisherman, it's near impossible for them to downsize. Um, if that's your bread and butter, and that's really what it's hard to downsize, go small and go to these techniques you're talking about. But you were talking earlier too about Lake Frederick, especially on your clear water. I'm often wonder if you don't downsize in line and size, you may not catch fish. Mm -hmm. And like you're saying, you're exactly right. Certain times of year, it will work. But sometimes you have to adjust to the conditions. And I know a lot of guys, too, that won't downsize. They won't throw the four or six-pound test. But yet I also know guys that when they do that, they've caught four or five-pound smallmouth, you know, on four-pound tests. Or six, and people, ah. But you mm -hmm. set your drag right. You got yeah. you let the rod do the work, you know, absorb that. Um, you, you, can, you can land them, you know. Yeah. So there's a time and place for it. But I just encourage people sometimes, like I say, it is hard – Sometimes if you're not used to that, you got to think outside the box, open your mind a little bit, yeah. but you know, it can definitely, you can definitely have success. I think if you, if you're allow yourself to try that technique. Yeah. The, the ultra the finesse and, and the nice part about it, this isn't expensive stuff to mm. get, mm. um, to, to get light line mm. and small hooks, small weights with like, you know, I'll even take old plastics that are all chewed up or busted up worms and I'll just cut them all the way down and make my own Ned rigs out of a Senko or, you know, the, the back of, you know, something, the same bait that I would use as like a trailer for my spinner bait is now the bait that I'm fishing. Um, I I've gone to that because when you're out there and you're not getting bites, it's easy to get, what am I doing wrong? Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's this, this isn't fun. You know, I took my weekend off. I'm out here and I'm not getting bites. Um, so I'm not afraid to go to the four and the six pound test mm -hmm. and fish ultra furnace. Yeah, it's, it's not that power fishing. You're not running and burning crankbaits. But again, it's it's very hard um, to throw those techniques in when you're looking in like 20 feet, you know. Uh, yeah, and, and something I'll, I'll add to that, uh, like for the people at home to understand the why. So when you go down in that diameter line, it, it's a lot harder for the fish to see, and it also creates more natural movement in the bait. And so the 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 what you give up with that though is the ability to really horse that fish in. Now, mm -hmm. w the important thing to understand about this is the trade off of the time of year. Um, I'm a very much a finesse guy because this is where I kind of grew up, and so. Throwing four pound test in the winter is different than throwing four pound test in the summer. And, and for two reasons, one is the fish's energy level. Um, if you stick a large mouth, four pounds in 30 degree water, he acts differently when hooked than if it is July. And so when you have that four mm -hmm. pound test, you know, you don't have to just bury him and and really horse him into the boat. So that's where the benefit of going to that lighter line is, is once you stick him, he's not gonna be fighting like he would in July. Um, the other part of it is their mouth. Um, when that water gets super cold, the mouth gets a lot harder. And so if you wanna go to that lighter line, you also need to make sure you match up your hooks, which is something I really learned the hard way growing up, is you can't go, if you're using a, a, a normal jig hook, you need to look at the diameter of that hook. 
because that might work great with 12 pound tests where you can really lean into them. But you need to go to that finesse style jig head to match the four pound test, like almost like a sticky sharp hook. Mm -hmm. So all you have to do is lean into them and you have them. Mm -hmm. And that's where I see a lot of people, they break off is because they didn't match the hook correctly to the line. And then they wail on them and bam, they snap. Um, but yeah, going down in line size is extremely important. Also in pressure. Um, I, I clean house at Jim Barnett park in Winchester, Virginia, and I've caught, I think the biggest bass out of there caught a six pounder. I'll use them four pound test because everybody is there throwing the exact same thing. But when you go super gnarly light in those colder water conditions, I know when I stick them, I don't have to, I'll just let the drag do the work and yep. I'll just let them tire out and it won't take long to tire them out, but you'll, you'll outfish people there. And it's that little thing of just going from, if everyone's throwing 12 pound, I go to four or maybe even six that gives me that leg up on mm -hmm. everybody around me. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you said something too, Neil, like the, uh, I was watching some videos on the founder of the Ned, Ned himself. Um, it's funny. It was funny to watch his, he was taking, you know, the, the six inch, you know, just ripping it in half. He didn't care in mm -hmm. the hooks he was using. It wasn't like the Z man. I mean, those are, those are good hooks, but it wasn't the flat, you know, head mushroom head. It was just a regular old ball round head, you know, jig hook. In other words, what I'm getting to is he didn't care. It didn't have to be, you know, we're so make sure everything yeah. exactly right. He just, you know, throw it on there and throw and it, it works, out there yeah. and it worked. And yeah. so, uh, anyway, and you were kind of alluding to that and that's the other thing too. It's, um, uh, I shouldn't be saying that as, you know, with the bait and tackle, you know, business type thing that color doesn't matter and that, <laughs> yeah. you know, you can yeah. just use anything in your thing, but, uh, but truly it is. I mean, it's, it's, uh, you can use what you have to go out there and catch fish. Yeah. So. There are layers. You could go, yeah. you can like golf, you can go down the rabbit crazy. hole with this yeah. thing and yeah. you can spend an hour talking about mm -hmm. color and different treble hooks and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But if you're a kid with your dad, you don't have to go down the rabbit hole with us yet. You'll get there mm -hmm. and you'll become addicted and spend all your money right. and get divorced and all that. But but beforehand, yep. just get a, a little bit of stuff, a variety, and you'll be fine. Mm -hmm. um, what were you going to say, Neil? Well, and, and the, the nice thing about these techniques is uh, you can take them anywhere in the country. Mm -hmm. They're going to, yep. the finesse fishing works everywhere. Um, if you, you know, pick this technique up and then move um to a lake that does have grass or even down like on the potomac or things like that like i'll still use my drop shot mm -hmm. you know when the bite gets tough anywhere you can always revert back so for me it's helped me um by kind of starting as a like an ultra finesse fisherman mm -hmm. um because i always looked up like what what like works everywhere what can i like mm -hmm. what, what am i going to catch the most fish on everybody wants to get bit look to immediately downsize your line don't look anything over 10 mm -hmm. you know keep it simple you know the you know with and you can get by with plastics and yeah. talk a little bit more about your drop shot like i know yeah. cause there's a lot of different uh you know how far from the way how do you to like to the, set it up how, how for, do you set up your um, drop I, I guess, shot is it the same for the river versus frederick and holiday like how, talk talk about that yeah um i go <laughs> yeah i do like multiple things um and and i'm gonna include the power shot in this mm -hmm. as well um and it really goes back to um a technique that i like whenever i'm fishing behind somebody whether this be a tournament situation or i know that somebody just came out of that cove and i'm still going to go in there or i know that i'm going one way up a bank and someone else is coming the other and then i'm just going to continue down and i'm going to be kind of like refishing where somebody just went through mm -hmm. um those are all conditions where the drop shot works wonders mm -hmm. um for I guess the listeners, anybody who doesn't know what this is, at the end of your line, essentially, instead of there being the lure there, it's a weight. Mm -hmm. And then anywhere from six inches to two feet above that mm -hmm. is where the lure is actually sitting. So you are slightly suspending mm -hmm. a lure. Um, you can either drop it straight down onto a fish as a vertical presentation mm -hmm. or cast it out and pull you. But regardless, it's really finesse and you're working a lure that is not sitting directly on the bottom. Mm -hmm. um, that's going to be where your weight is. Again, for me, depth is, is going to be the only thing that I'm really concerned about because it is going to be light line. So if I'm dropping to anything um, 20 feet plus, I just want it to get down there quicker. Mm -hmm. So I would even go as far to go to a half ounce weight. Um, and I just buy, you know, 
you can get very creative, but my go-to is I prefer the teardrop style drop shot. Some people go to the cylinder style um, or just like a regular round. I prefer the teardrop because for me, I can. it's good enough to get by with in the river, mm -hmm. but also I can take it to the lakes and pull it through, you know, wood and brush. So it's kind of like the teardrop style is the, the roundabout both. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I'll buy the cheap water gremlin brand mm -hmm. um and you can get a pack of like 10 or 12 for you know 99 cents i think and that's i want to just again touch on that yeah you don't have to buy 25 dollar tungsten to start out please yeah. don't i i i think in tournament situations and i think we talked about this earlier about it, the one percent advantage yes mm -hmm. if you're fishing a tournament it will give you advantage but if you're a kid and you want to have your dollar stretch more get the cheapo ones get the cheapest you can because you're going to go through drop shot weights you're going to snag yeah you're getting hung up that's what yeah. that's that's what's going to happen so instead of breaking off a, a four dollar you know three eighths ounce tungsten weight you know it's it's like a four cent piece of lead mm -hmm. teardrop and emotionally you'll be yeah, better off yeah the day. And, and the nice part about the drop shot too is hopefully when you do get hung up it is just the weight so a lot of times you can reel back up and your lure and hook presentation mm -hmm. is still mm -hmm. there sure. um i guess next going with so if i'm not fishing deep then i want to go as light as possible so the quarter ounce um is my go-to for that three eighths if for river currents and stuff like that if i really want it to get down um, but most of the time, this is a technique where I go as light as I can get away with. Mm -hmm. um, so wind is a factor to cast and things like that. And then if am I dropping over the side of the boat onto a fish or am I going to cast and drag? Mm -hmm. um, my next, I guess, would be the, the type of lure. Again, it doesn't matter anything from a dream shot. Um, the Strike King dream shot would be kind of like the first that I got into um, when I was drop shotting. Um, but now I'll drop shot in almost like a wacky rig. I'll, I'll use a wacky worm, which is just like a Sanko hooked in the middle. And I've used that. I've also played around with line size. So instead of maybe going to, you know, the four to six pound with a little, you know, micro minnow on the end of it, I'll go to 20 pound with like, you know, a three quarter ounce weight mm -hmm. and I'll throw it in brush and I, and I will try to drag something weedless um, where mm -hmm. I just brought my jig through and maybe that is to get my extra bite. Um, mm -hmm. So all of these kind of techniques you can play around with or on the Potomac and things like that. You can up your line size a little bit, but generally speaking, light as possible. Um, you're going to get the most realistic action out of the bait. What do you like to do from um, from weight to hook what what kind of distance do you like there usually in your drop shot um rule of thumb for me is 14 inches mm -hmm. would be my standard setup at, at 14 inches and i will downsize depending on if i'm not getting bit or things of that nature um but for the most part i'm, I'm about 14 inches mm -hmm. um now if i'm going if i know i'm not dropping on a fish and i'm doing an actual cast out and you know pulling um, a retrieve in, then I will go to a little bit longer just because I know my presentation. Mm -hmm. um, I want to get it off the bottom. And a quick tip for everyone at home, generally start with a longer leader because you can always cut it shorter than yep. trying to go with a shorter leader and then you having to retie all day. I mean, mm -hmm. we're also, you know, you're going to get information on this, but you two, you still can't beat YouTube. Oh, you no, mean, you, you um, can't. Yeah. I was thinking about the hook too. I mean, they make hooks where you can tie in from the, the bottom down and, and top up. Yeah. Um, but Skeet Reese, you know, he had a YouTube out where the, using the Polymar knot mm -hmm. uh, to, to create your uh, drop shot. And then, then you can use any type of hook you want. It doesn't have to be a drop shot. And that's the other thing, too. Be creative with it. Yeah. I know a guy caught a huge smallmouth uh, drop shot in a tube of all things. I would never think to do that. But, hey, it worked. It caught a fish. Um, and now, depending on the state regulations where you are, you could even go to, instead of that weight on the bottom, is a Ned Rig. Mm -hmm. and then yes. up on the line so you can get very yes. creative That's, i'm glad you mentioned that because bassmaster ran a little thing a tip you know and sometimes you got to find these things in the magazines and these little tips are down there hidden but the double drop shot is what they yeah. refer to so you can drop you know double your chances and uh and put anything you want a jig or whatever you mm -hmm. want is the weight now you've got two presentations my cousin actually did that at lake frederick a good bit and he actually would put the same you know same worm on it 
and kind of see top to bottom, you know, which was, you know, yeah. more effective or whatever. But, you know, something else you could try. You yeah, know, And or, again, check your tournament, like, regulations and everything to make sure you're not going to get in trouble for that. But if you're fun fishing, again, also just check with, you know, Virginia Fishing Game if you live in Virginia and wherever you live to make sure that that's completely legal, mm -hmm. of course. Yeah. But, and another great, I guess, to bring into my final point that I want to talk about would be um, in, a, in a team situation or if you have a buddy on the boat with you. Play around with your leader side. Yeah. Maybe I'll put mine at like six inches and then mm -hmm. someone else will go to like 20 to 24 mm -hmm. and just see where that success is. Um, but I feel like so much and, and I see what a lot of people do and, and hearing gripes from other people. And now I'm, I'm kind of at the stage where I do hear and I've thought about, all right, well, what's what's next, you know, for me? And, and it is looking towards, you know, being a co-angler and, you know, fishing bigger tournaments and things like that um and i hear the complaints of you know fishing the back of the boat or the guy in front of me he never put me in a good shot it's something to think about whether you're a father and a son or it's just like you're bringing your buddy out with you for the day um the way you approach a dock or go down the bank you really have to be conscious um and, and if you're in a team tournament you really have to be conscious you want to look at it as you want to give both guys the opportunity to have the best chance to put fish in the boat. Mm -hmm. um, so your boat positioning and how you, you know, go into things and how you hit a dock on um, the communication there. Cause I think for most of us that have been fishing and have fished on the back of somebody's boat, um, we know what it's like to get ready to make a cast and, you know, somebody's moving off or, you know, the guy in front has already picked every pole on that dock or mm -hmm. brought something down the bank and you're you know stuck to well now i just gotta throw off the back and just mm -hmm. drag something um but you really need if you're the boater in any situation whether it's fun fishing um it, it's something that you really need to be conscious of um to to try to get the guy in the back an equal opportunity um to get on stuff and i've been back boated plenty of times mm -hmm. where it's like man i just flipped in there and like got nothing so it's not the end of the world if you are in that situation because mm -hmm. sometimes that's the second look that gets them that's right or the um, back angle on that post i mean he's hitting one angle and then as you go through you you might be catching a different angle on that post mm -hmm. or like you said i've seen too where you went around a boat and maybe it's already been a fish coming through we fished through turn around look and see a guy stick a four pounder like wow we had just fished that dock yeah. so, so yeah. don't don't give up either like you say on the back i mean that is you know a problem sometimes but doesn't always yeah. have to be a problem yeah, keep yeah. thrown to it even mm -hmm. if it has been thrown to throw it to it again yeah and, and th i mean and that's thankfully how i started uh, i was able to meet someone that did have a boat and had access so any chance that i got or there was an open spot i tried to you know get out there and again be respectful because i'm on someone else's mm -hmm. boat but i'm also out here like well geez like I just got bit and now he's driving away from it. And it's like, you know, how does that work? And, you know, I felt like I wasn't getting, you know, a good opportunity to catch fish. So it's just something I think that is unsaid and, and not really talked about, um, you know, especially fun fishing. Whenever I have somebody that either if it's a buddy of mine or, you know, a small kid or, you know, anybody else that's not me, I want them to have a good experience and enjoy you know why i love fishing and things like that mm. so it's it's very important um yeah if you get on a few up in the front like that's great but mm. you know it, it's for me i get just as much enjoyment as seeing somebody else able to boat a nice one too and uh that's where i i feel like my boat positioning of starting as being a co-angler or the guy in the back of the boat has really helped me mm -hmm. as now being, you know, the guy up front in the trolling motor to understand those mm -hmm. types of things. It, That's cool. That's shout out to Jim then too, because I know you fish with Jim a lot. And yeah. He, he's always sending me pictures. He's big, small mouth and stuff. And I know you guys are fishing together. So Yeah, cool. that's, I mean, and quite frankly, I'm very rarely am I out on the water by myself. Um, my best friend, um, he's married with a, a young child now, and he used to be my fishing partner so i've now graduated it sound like he's died <laughs> yeah <laughs> right so i have now graduated to his father has then replaced him um on the boat and and yes yeah, the same thing um and, and he's super cool and you know we we've never had any any problems of things like that but 
I just subconsciously, it's something that goes unsaid and especially in a fishing tournament situation of what there is money on the line, things like that. Um, you never want to feel like the guy in the back of the boat isn't either contributing mm -hmm. or you're cutting him off and not giving him a good mm -hmm. casting angle of things like that. So again, the way I fish when it's just me and my boat position is completely different than when I have someone else on the boat. And I don't know, just for me, that was important because I was thankful to get out there initially with guys who handled it the same way with like a Ray Myers, mm -hmm. um, who was able to take me out and get me on the boat and, you know, start fishing. And, you know, it was a great time, even from the back of the boat. That's cool, Neil. I really appreciate, you know, let's look at the evolution, you know, over the years from mm -hmm. bank fishermen to where you are now. And, just, yeah. you know, and, and I think we were talking about that earlier too. How many, how important it is to be good stewards of this sport, but also be able to network within the sport mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and be able to take other people fishing and sharing that passion, sharing the knowledge, you know, and all those things. And, uh, and so it's been really cool to see, uh, in, in your bay, it's come full circle. Now you're actually, uh, returning that favor for other people. So, yeah. um, is there a way that people can reach out to you, whether it be questions on these different bodies of water, or if you said you have a boat, Maybe uh, you could take them fishing if somebody um, is new to it and wanted to get on. Is uh, Where could they find you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm on Facebook and Instagram both. My Instagram is just Q Fishing, mm -hmm. so the letter Q and then fishing after that. And then Facebook is just my name, Neil Quince. You can find me on there. And again, I'm, I'm happy to take anybody out. There's been times if I'm out by myself and I pull up to the ramp and I see somebody on the bank, I'm always trying to welcome them on because mm -hmm. i know what that was like for me um and it's just it's half the time i was like i don't even care if i catch fish you know right. i'm out on a, boat. on a boat finally yeah. you just because yeah. the perception is man if i just got out there i would unlock so many more fish which yeah. isn't always the case right. um but it, it is nice and and to open that opportunity up to other people so yeah I'm, I'm happy to take anybody out in this area or if you just want tips or pointers i'll be happy to take you out i got i got no spot that i wouldn't show you or no lure <laughs> that i wouldn't give you or show you how to use it um so yeah thank you guys neil thank you for coming on we're definitely gonna have you back on again thanks again guys everything from the episode will be in the episode description this has been Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. Who's this here? Jared Mounts. We'll see you next time. See ya. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.